meditating on these words this week from Colossians. May you be strong. May you be prepared. May you endure everything. And give thanks to our God, the one who has enabled you. As Dan was uh, saying this morning, my, my dad always had a saying, and I, I'm sure it's familiar to many of you, um, that if it moves and it shouldn't, just get a little duct tape and stick it right on there. And if it moves, if it doesn't move and it should, it's rusted old shut, just take a little can of oil, WD-40 will do, and uh, oil that and get it moving again. And with those two simple items, surely there isn't anything in this world that can't be fixed. <laughs> <laughs> One time, um, when I was much younger, I had um, I found myself on a threshold. I uh, had uh, served some congregations, and I was um, just wrapping up working as a youth director at a, a large congregational church. And I had finally stepped into a, a place of discernment, and a place of understanding that my life was headed towards ministry for real. And I decided to apply and was accepted to go to seminary at Chicago Theological Seminary. So, here I am at this threshold, and I am driving north on I-25 on the Front Range um, from my home in Colorado Springs to Chicago. I was a free man. I was on the road. I was holding the steering wheel, and I made that decision to finally take that step of faith forward to go to seminary. And I drove to Fort Collins, which was my first layover on that uh, drive to move to Chicago, and I thought about my life's journey up to that point. This was something that was new. It was a beginning. It was something big, something unknown. And I had take, taken all my belongings and managed to pack them into my favorite pickup truck, this mustard yellow 1970s Dodge Ram that was piece of junk, <laughs> and I was cruising on I-25 just as happy as could be. The truck was my vehicle of destiny. And as I flipped that turn signal to exit the highway to get to Fort Collins to stop for the night, I heard a clank <laughs> from under the hood. Pulling into my friend's driveway, I stopped the truck and looked under the hood and to my dismay, a piece of the engine was dangling in a way that it should not have been. <laughs> and after some investigation uh, online, I discovered that it was something called an alternator, <laughs> which explained why my, why my truck continued to operate up until I had turned it off while in the driveway. The alternator is a piece of the engine that when you turn the key in the ignition, it goes rrr, rrr, and revs up the other pieces of the engine to get it going. Sorry, car experts. That was the non-technical explanation <laughs> and the extent of my knowledge of how an engine works. What I can say is that not only was the alternator dangling from the engine, but there was also no way I could put it back in place. You see, the bolts hadn't failed attaching the alternator to the engine. The piece of metal on the engine block where the bolts were threaded through, that metal had broken off. So the shell of the engine itself, of where the alternator was attached, was, was broken. So I... Um, was in a little state of panic. I, I thought about all these miles I had to travel. And using a little bit of, of creativity and ingenuity, I found a piece of wood and some duct tape, and I wedged the wood underneath the alternator until it fit back into the engine like a puzzle piece. And then I did my due diligence to secure the alternator and the piece of wood stabilizing it to the engine. <laughs> 
<laughs> Had I done a good enough job, would my effort be sufficient to get me to where I was headed? Would the duct tape and piece of wood hold my truck together for the thousand mile drive from Fort Collins to Chicago? See, trucks break, especially mine. And foolish as I was, I really did think that my 1970s pickup truck, which had sat in a farmer's field for 20 years, and which I had bought for $500 off of Craigslist, was going to get me all the way to Chicago. <laughs> Maybe with a hope and a prayer. You see, life is not perfect. And not everything happens the way we wish it would. Things break. The world falls apart. Dreams are dashed in an instant. And I was so sure that I was called to ministry and to go to Chicago Theological Seminary. Yet, as I stood back from my truck after duct taping the engine back together, I was sh sure that I was at the end of my dream. I would be stranded in Fort Collins. I would never make it. I failed. Have you ever been so sure of something in your life? You know where you're going, and you know how you're going to get there. Your dream is right in front of you, yet something unforeseeable gets in your way. Something stalls you. Your plans break down, and you find yourself stranded without a clue about what even broke and how you should go about fixing it properly, when you don't even have the right tools to fix it. I mean, duct tape? A piece of wood? Thankfully, I had something going for me which was a little bit of faith and hope. Not unlike those um, whom we hear in today's scripture. In the days of the Apostle Paul, budding communities of Christians were blooming across the Mediterranean. These young churches had been nurtured as faith communities by the teachings of Paul and the stories of Christ. And the Colossians were no different. At some point, it was brought to the attention of the Apostle Paul that the Colossians had incorporated local non-Christian beliefs into their faith life. One of these beliefs was that the spirits of the dead were among us, and we needed to pray to them because they controlled the will of the world. The church in Colossae began to lose their faith in the primacy of Christ and abandoned the doctrinal teachings of uh, the church for ones that felt more comfortable and in line with the ones that their ancestors had believed. They turned away from Christ and the teachings of Paul to other teachers, to other spirits, to other people for hope. See, Paul had worked so hard to help bring dozens of churches to life. Church planting is hard business. It takes a lot of skill and effort and diligence and watering and nurturing. The faith communities that Paul had pulled together needed constant reminding and teaching. Hence why we have so many prolific writings from Paul, which have survived to this day to become a part of our scriptures. He wrote so that we may be reminded of why we come to Christ, of why we gather in these faith communities week in and week out. He wrote to clarify beliefs, to encourage, to outline the doctrines of what made a community Christ-like. It was probably difficult for Paul to hear that these communities that he invested so much energy and effort into had returned to their old ways. Paul was most likely in prison at the time that he wrote the letter to the Colossians. And here he was, stuck in prison, not able to get to the Colossians to coach them and help them through these difficult times. And so Paul wrote... With a pastoral voice, he filled pages with words of encouragement and love, telling those Colossians and those early Christ communities what it means to really put faith in God and 
faith in Christ. He spoke to the fears that that community must have felt that made them abandon their teachings and start praying to these spirits that they felt held so much sway. He wrote passionately to help these communities move forward. And thank goodness that we have these writings to remind us that even in our own day and age, we struggle to latch on to other teachers, to other spirits, to other people for hope. And we forget how important and grounding Christ is. Paul reminds us in today's scripture that God holds all things together. Ah, I just I love that phrase. God holds all things together. Not you, not me, not someone else. God. Paul proclaimed that Christ is the head of the church. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. This is an important statement because it reminds us as Christians that when we put Christ first, then all things are possible. All fear and anxiety, all worries, the path ahead. We can do all things in Christ with the power of God. This is an important statement and has been used over and over again since Paul wrote this in this letter to the Colossians to remind us Christians that what is most important to us is a faith in God and Christ whenever we lose our way. Even the United Church of Christ, our denomination, has needed to hear these words, so much so that they were included in the preamble of our denomination's constitution. On Tuesday, June 25, 1957, in Cleveland, Ohio, the Congregational Christian Churches and the Evangelical and Reformed Churches joined together as the United Church of Christ. This union was decades in the making, and it took seven years from the adoption of the Articles of Union to actually implement the United Church of Christ. Despite the obstacles to overcome, such as numerous meetings, theological reconciliations and differences, and even court battles, legal litigation, trying to stop our denomination from merging to become who we are today. Louis Gunnaman is by far the most um, prominent expert in the union of the UCC and the author of the well-read The Shaping of the United Church of Christ, written in 1977 and published by the UCC's very own Pilgrim Press. He believed that there were many reasons for why the UCC shouldn't even exist, yet Despite the odds, it was made manifest by the perseverance and the strength and the will of the people who were involved, upholding Jesus' own prayer that we may all be one. Upon the completion of the Union, a new constitution outlining the tenets of Union emerged as the dust had settled. In the second paragraph of that preamble of the Constitution of our United Church of Christ proclaims, the United Church of Christ acknowledges as its sole head Jesus Christ, Son of God and Savior. It acknowledges as kindred in Christ all who share this confession. It looks to the Word of God and the Scriptures and to the presence and power of the Holy Spirit to prosper its creative and redemptive work in the world. It claims as its own the faith of the historic Church expressed in the ancient creeds and reclaimed in the basic insight from the Protestant reformers. It affirms the responsibility of the church in each generation to make this faith its own in reality of worship, in honesty of thought and expression, and in purity of heart before God, and in accordance with the teaching of our Lord and practice and prevailing among evangelical Christians. It recognizes two sacraments 
baptism, and the Lord's Supper, or Holy Communion. This preamble to the UCC Constitution was published in 1961, and it echoed something familiar that we read this morning. No creed but Christ. No book but the Bible. The preamble, interestingly enough, is heard most often during ordination services for new clergy. And we hear it this morning in this church, on Reign of Christ Sunday, when we give thanksgiving for the life and ministry of Jesus over the order of all things in creation. Paul's gospel word to the Colossians is a prayerful reminder that despite the darkness of this world, and the fear that things are falling apart at the seams, God holds all things together through Christ and Christ's sacraments. As I climbed into that mustard yellow pickup truck to get back on the road to Chicago, the road to seminary, the road to ordination, the road that has led me here to you, I could not have known what other obstacles lay ahead. The truck started with duct tape and a prayer, and unfortunately it broke down again in North Platte, Nebraska, <laughs> where I abandoned it um, in a blaze of um, uh, engine oil spewing across my windshield, driving down the freeway, and I had to let that go. And I found in the classified newspaper in North Platte, Nebraska, someone who was selling a blue van that was big enough to carry all my belongings. As I sat in the home of the elderly man who sold me that blue van, we were both in awe to learn that he was a retired Baptist minister and I was a budding young seminarian. And somehow, in the great vastness of the world, our paths had crossed that very morning. In the midst of my fear that the world was falling apart because my silly broken pickup truck had fallen apart, I was ready to let go of my hopes and dreams. I thought they were dashed. But there, in that living room in the prairie, I was reminded that God holds all things together. In our shared belief that Christ is the head of the church, that Baptist minister and I broke bread together and shared a meal. And in a pastoral voice that I so desperately needed at that time, he encouraged me in my ministry. Despite our theological differences, despite the darkness and the brokenness of this world. Before I pulled away, that old Baptist minister waddled out from behind his garage with a can of WD-40. <laughs> And he opened the door to the van, which creaked, and he sprayed those hinges. And he handed me that can of WD-40 oil and said, Here, take this. You're going to need it. <laughs> Franciscan Philip Yates writes in the theology of Don, John Duns Scotus that Christ is the masterpiece of love in the midst of of a creation designed for love, not a divine plumber come to fix the mess of original sin. Jesus is the masterpiece of love in a world designed for love, not a plumber who comes to fix the mess. Duct tape and oil are good, but they can only do so much. We need sacraments of love in a world growing and changing and evolving. We need sacraments to help hold our dreams together and to keep those dreams from groaning. We need something that can keep us moving ahead, step by step, on this amazing journey called life. In a world that knows brokenness and fear, it's important to have Christ and God to have sacraments of bread and baptism, and even have duct tape through the oil. What is duct tape for your journey? What is oil for you? 
what is duct tape and oil for our congregation as we seek to move ahead, to find out what is next on our adventure. Wherever I travel, I always carry duct tape and a can of WD-40 with me, knowing that these two things can fix a lot. Yet there's also something I carry in my heart as well, and that is Christ, who is the image of an invisible God, the one through whom God holds all things together, or God who holds this church together, or God who holds me together, or God who holds you together. Not because we are broken, but because we are pieces of art in a landscape of love, guided and painted by the master artist who uses duct tape and oil from time to time. Amen.